Paul, thank you very much for what I thought was a particularly lucid presentation. I think it was full of insights and uh, clearly lays out the challenges as well. So we're going to hear from Joe and we're going to hear from John. And so without any further ado, Joe, can I ask you to, yeah. to respond to that, thank, please? Thanks very much and thanks, Paul, both for um, your presentation and, and for the report, both of which I found very helpful. Um, just in responding to it, I think I'm prim primarily going to focus on your Proposition B, um, which is about the effectiveness of certain actions, um, not because I don't have an interest in the kind of more immediate operational data, but I think I'm also particularly interested in, if you like, that next stage up around how we understand whether what we're doing overall is, is effective. Um, and I guess I think what I liked about this report is I think it makes very clear that the challenge is not only about providing more evidence, but actually about improving the quality of it. I think that's very important. Um, but there's something in there also about how we invest more and differently in, the, if, you, if you like, the kind of evidence architecture um, and the, the culture of evidence-based um, decision-making within the sector. And I think in order to do that, we need to sort of increase um, the volume of spending in this area, as you, as you say. But we probably also need to increase the efficiency of our existing resource um, that, that, we, that we do actually uh, invest in humanitarian evidence. Um, so just as a, from a sort of donor perspective, and as a donor kind of trying to invest in this sector, I just thought it might be useful to share some of the things that we're thinking about, about how to um, increase the, the, the quality and quantity um, of humanitarian evidence in this space. Um, and just to pick up again, in terms of the definition that's laid out in your kind of helpful edited version, um, I think when I'm talking, I'm going to talk not only about evidence collected by international humanitarian organisations, but a kind of broader array of actors, including academics, who, who are collecting evidence in this, in this space. So I am interested in formal research. And the reason for that is because I think key to improving quality of evidence in this space is to be complementing um, the kind of short-term consultancy model that I think we're all very familiar with in this space um, with a more rigorous and extensive evidence base. And I'm going to caricature a little bit here, but I think we're all fairly familiar with what I sort of characterise as a sort of 43-day consultancy where consultant teams are required to examine incredibly large, complicated programmes in very, very small um, periods of time in order to come out with some piece of paper that um, I presume donors are, are going to find credible in terms of accounting for performance. Now, I am, being, I am caricaturing it quite deliberately, but I think we do have quite a lot of these quick and dirty studies within the sector and I wonder whether we should be moving to fewer, cleaner and more rigorous studies. Um, and I think if you look, for example, at, I just looked this morning at the uh, ANAP database on Haiti, and there were 48 reports just on your uh, database. And I wonder whether you know, 12 would have been a, a, a better number, because we could have had fewer better. And I think what follows from this kind of short term and, and, and very <coughs> numerous studies is that the, the methodologies end up, end up being necessarily limited and tend towards what Mark Bradbury once called um, research by chatting, um, which we then tend to reframe as highly qualitative uh, research, um, which I think is actually sort of dishonours really kind of rigorous uh, qualitative research. Um, and I think if I was looking to for a few things that uh, would help in terms of improving quality, I've got a list of about four things. The first is I think we need to have more systematic and rigorous and independent data around beneficiary um, views in terms of quality. And we're not doing that at the moment and we're not collecting that type of data in a particularly systematic way and in a way that allows us to compare over space and time. Um, you won't be surprised working for uh, the organisation I do that I say we would really like more analysis of cost. Um, and we think this is important, um, not just because we're, we obsess about VFM, but because we are actually quite concerned about increasing coverage. And to give you a very basic example, some cost analysis we did of our response in Pakistan found that exactly the same intervention was being delivered by one agency for £500 per intervention, another one for £50, and there was no correlation between the um, impact and the cost. Um, so, you know, to put it very crudely, we could have had 10 of the things uh, for the same price as one, which basically means we can reach more people. So it's an opportunity cost uh, when, we're, uh, when we're investing inefficiently, and so more information about cost would be very helpful. 
I think we could also do with improving understanding of coverage. Uh, at the moment, we don't really know how many people are receiving what and, if you like, at what depth. So we have quite crude understanding around coverage. Um, and then finally, as, as you referred to, Paul, we have very little understanding in terms of impact. And I think we're quite excited about trying out RCTs a bit more. As you say, they are very, very expensive. Um, but I think we, we are concerned to kind of experiment a little bit more with, with what that kind of set of methods can do for us. So those are some of the things that I'd like to see in terms of um, more quality. In terms of improving efficiency, I think there are a couple of things to flag up here. At the moment, what we have is huge, we're actually very data rich. I mean, huge, huge, amount, quanti huge quantities of data are held by individual agencies at individual project level. But the problem is they tend to be locked in at that project level. And that means that you can only kind of use that data once for very narrow operational purposes. And wouldn't it be interesting if we could actually open up a lot of that data so that different people could be mining it at different times for different purposes? Now, we're seeing at the moment that the UK government's having quite an interesting time trying to do exactly this in terms of mining health data uh, held by GPs. And this is understandably a kind of subject of, of some concern because people are, main, are concerned around issues of confidentiality and about how those data will be used. So there are not small ethical or practical issues about using, if you like, that, those big data approaches, but actually the potential benefits, if we can, if we can um, tackle those ethical and practical issues, are probably really worth um, working through. The second thing is about, to increase the efficiency of data, is about the value of synthesis, which again you flagged up, Paul. And basically, by synthesising multiple studies, you're obviously able to increase their power, and that basically means that you can be more confident if those individual studies are well done about the results. So it in increases the rate of return on those individual studies. So again, we're very interested in supporting initiatives um, that enable that synthesis, and also importantly, help us to navigate the quality of these different individual studies. Because often we go, oh, there's tons of material on it, but if they're all rubbish studies, you've got rubbish in, rubbish out, so they're not very helpful. So it's kind of how do we really get a grip of how confident we can be. So the second sort of or third area I'd like to talk about is about culture and architecture, because producing more and better evidence is only one bit of the puzzle. And I think you flagged up very clearly towards the end, Paul, about we need to think about how people can access and use data. And I think in our sector it is quite complicated in medicine, um, where sort of evidence-based practice is quite advanced. It's I wouldn't say easy, but you have got, I would imagine, billions being spent on training doctors around the world. Mm. And you've also got a very sophisticated structure of licensing. Um, whereas in our little space, uh, we're quite multidisciplinary, we're self-regulated if we're regulated at all. And there's quite a lot of ambiguity, I think, within the sector around professional standards. And I think in that context, if you like, providing the incentives for practitioners to see adoption of evidence-based approaches as important part of their work is going to require a kind of soft, if you like, culture shift. And I think this sort of conversation is very helpful in, in enabling that. But we do also, I think, probably need to think about some of the harder incentives. In my own organisation, in order to remain accredited as a humanitarian advisor, you have to undertake a minimum number of hours of continuing professional development. You have to be able to demonstrate in, that, in your performance <coughs> appraisal at the end of the year. And if you want to get resources out of the organisation, you have to be able to demonstrate the evidence under which you, you, on which you're, you're basing the assumption that if you do X, then Y will happen. Um, and so there's a kind of quite, we're trying to embed, if you like, those evidence-based uh, processes into our business model, which is, which is proving quite interesting. Um, and I think equally on the cor corollary, it's also about incentives to collaborate with academics. And I think one of the things that has been quite interesting historically is for academics to enter in this space, the incentives haven't been particularly high because there hasn't been very much money around and it's been quite hard, valiant exceptions like John um, aside, to kind of make your career as a kind of uh, a rigorous scientist working in this space. So I think increasing the professional incentives, if you like, for the scientific community to engage is also important. And we're trying to do that, for example, through our collaboration with the Wellcome Trust um, and, and to make it a condition of funding that there are these collaborations between academics and operational agencies. Um, final piece on this is around the sort of knowledge architecture. And I think the repositories, such as the one that you run, are very important. 
Um, and I think in the future it's going to be quite important to think about the repositories not only for evaluative uh, information but more generally in terms of data. And I think OCH has got quite an interesting project on, uh, on at the moment about how to create a kind of framework in which you can dock various different types of data um, in order to enable that kind of data mining and, and, and big data type initiative um, that, that is emerging quite strongly. So the problem with all of this is that it requires quite a lot of money, potentially. Um, and where does that all come from? Um, to a degree, I think we can get some gains actually just through improving the efficiency of what we do. As I say, I think we are funding quite a lot of small, poor quality studies. And I do wonder if we kind of pooled our, some, some of our collective resource around that, we'd get a better return on, on our investment. I think at the moment it's quite tough to argue about how we should be pu putting more humanitarian funding into, if you like, humanitarian R&D um, because the pressure on budgets is so incredibly tight and I think that pressure is getting much worse rather than better. But I do wonder whether part of what we should be doing is trying to access some quite big pots of money that exist in the research space. So, for example, within the European Commission they have very large frameworks um, in relation to research and innovation that, to date, to my knowledge, haven't been fully tapped. Within DFID, we now have a commitment to invest um, the equivalent of 3% of our humanitarian assistance, but through our, our research budget lines on innovation and evidence in this space. Um, and what we see is big funders like the Wellcome, like the Economic and Social Research Council, beginning to crowd with us and to add their expertise and their money to the pot. So I think you know we should be engaging with those research funders um, to crowd their money in. So finally, I don't think it's a, a question. I think the question of you know whether or not we should be evidence based. I think we've kind of got over that and addressed that, and that's that's actually quite good because I think actually interestingly for a while there that was sort of contested in a funny way. Um, but uh, so I think it's good that we're now in a place where it, it, you know it is a bit like motherhood and apple pie that this is what we should what we should do. Um, but I think there are still some quite big questions about how we do it, including how we fund it. Um, and I do wonder whether the World Humanitarian Summit, and particularly its focus on effectiveness and innovation, could provide some real opportunities to, pu to push forward that agenda. Mm -hmm. I'll stop there.